I'm Mary Jane Fahey and this is my friend Liz Friedman, a fashion icon and a New York woman. Um, I'd like to know what makes a woman like you a woman like you? You are something <laughs> I can't else. believe you really said that. <laughs> from what movie did that come? It was from some movie, What Makes a Girl Like You a Girl Like You. But anyway, you know, I think it's pretty hard to, to take a single thing. I think you just sort of become this, um, this persona, maybe from a lot of people commenting on it, you know, when you get more and more into it. I can't really tell you. But uh, it, 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 to me, it's very, very amusing to be 81 years old and suddenly it's like everybody's discovering me and everybody thinks I'm this hot stuff and this fabulosity <laughs> over here. And it wasn't always that way. But I think that the older I got, the more I became who I really am. How beautiful. And it was, it's a part of me that I think I always kept the lid on. It's like last night. I was at a, an extraordinary program at the Philharmonic, and it's in honor, it, you know, it's now the 100th anniversary of women gaining the vote in this country. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Wonderful. For, yeah, it is, and they have a whole special project at the Philharmonic, and they're, uh, every, every um, week they have a different young woman composer um, that probably would never, never ordinarily get a hearing. And the young woman last night, uh, I forget her name, was a New York woman, and she, the piece was magnificent, and it was based on a poem by Yeats. And uh, I think it's somehow called treading, like don't tread on me. Yeah. And she talked, she started to give an introduction to the whole Philharmonic and the whole audience about what we're gonna hear. And she said, you'll hear very, very powerful voices coming in from many, many different interests, uh, from many instruments and suddenly you'll hear them cut off or just fade out, and those are women's voices. And mm. that's what we all learn to do. Mm. It was self-censuring, and it was just always being cut off. Oh, and at the very horrible. end, you will hear that the whole thing, just every sound just fades as they just sort of oh, gave in. Very they powerful. Couldn't keep, they couldn't, those voices could not keep fighting anymore. Well, I actually segued into a question I was going to ask you. I've hung out with you enough to know that you are quite the feminist, aren't you? Of course. Yes. <laughs> of course. How can you be a single New York woman and not be? Yes. How can you be? And uh, But I also take it one further, and it's every time I meet a woman who's married, I say, how can you truly be a feminist, which is an old, old notion of it. But I forget who developed the theory about, you know, every time you go to bed with a man, you're sleeping with the enemy. You said that the yeah. other day. And I, and I sometimes really do feel that way. Because I don't care who they are. I don't care who they are and how much they try. Most men just don't get it. They don't get it and they don't understand it. So when did you come to that conclusion? When did you let go of the romance, even sexual part of your life and just say, this is who I am? I, I can't say it was on any particular day or at any particular time, but that it just evolved. I mean, yes. I was sexually active until I was about 45. Yeah. And then it just sort of ceased to be. I was just not spending time on that, nor was I interested in it. I was interested in my career. Yes. I was interested in my women friends. I was interested in experiences. but. Uh, men being the driving force of my life, no. those days were over. They were just over. It was not a part of my life that I ever considered successful. Yes. Um, my relationships with men, in fact, at times people ask me, did you ever really love any man? And I couldn't, well, I did, but they were never men that, with whom I was sexually involved. Yes. Soon as sex came into the picture, somehow for me there was a lack of respect. And, and that's a very telling statement. A lack of respect you had for, for them. them. Yes. 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 And for, you know, an, another thing that I knew I couldn't keep them without practicing what are called feminine wiles. You know, the flirtiness, the cuteness. And the and opposite I, of who you are. And I hated myself doing yes. it. And I hated them buying into that part of me. Yes. I hated them and didn't respect them for that at all. Yes, it was an and act. Somehow they just went from the foreground to the background, mm. and I cannot tell you where. And they, the older I get, the more they are into, into yes. the background. The richer and richer. And I richer. find that as women get older, their lives become richer and they become more radicalized and more fascinating to be with, and most men fold up. And I you're a funny. busy woman, you're out and about all the time. <laughs>
You see everything? Uh, everything. And it's uh, Fashion Week. Do you, are you out there? Uh, no, I didn't even know it was. I think no. it's starting today. Oh, because I was just at the Vintage Show last week, which is a big show. Oh, yes. It's always in conjunction with Fashion Week. Did you go? Is no, it the no, I didn't. No. Oh, it's marvelous. It's oh, just yes. Marvelous. Yeah, yeah. It's is wonderful. it still on? Or no, it's just, just two weekend. days. It's yes. always Wednesday. It's a Friday and a Saturday. And it's it's it, it's tremendously exciting. I love it. And I wish, you know, at this stage of my life where I have enough clothes that if I change three times a day <laughs> for the next two years, I couldn't even begin to scratch the surface of this. And here I am buying more stuff. And oh, I, I was going to ask you about your storage unit. Oh, Are they all about over? That. But I will be one swell-dressed corpse. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a late bloomer? Absolutely, totally, and completely. You know, it's interesting that people always saw me as the great iconoclast, that I come in just sort of smashing all the barriers, and and that wasn't true. You know, I related much more to something that Anne Bancroft once said about her. describing herself. Mm. And uh, there was, she had an agent, a guy named Bernie Seligman, who lived across the hall from me, and he told me this about her. <laughs> she said she had real New York speech. You know, Bernie, she says, I have a reputation in the business of being a rule breaker. She said, it isn't true. She said, I'm just too stupid to figure out what the rules are. <laughs> you know, and that's how I felt when everybody saw me this way. I, you know, I, I didn't get, I'm trying very hard to follow the rules, but somehow I didn't seem to understand them. I didn't seem to get it. And I'd always come across as very outrageous and somebody, you know, who, who just is, you know, they're, they're this great iconoclast, but I didn't see myself that way at all. In fact, I thought I was sort of, very well behaved and, and very conforming and I hated the fact that I conformed as much as I did. Well, I guess what I'm thinking of is the fact that you became this jewelry designer later in life after you retired and I love the story of how you broke into Bergdorf's. Not broke in. <laughs> it's such a good story. Yeah, that was very, very funny. <laughs> It, it, I must say somebody put the idea in my head and I don't really remember who it was, but you know, I was trying, you know, I did this wonderful jewelry and I was selling it like crazy in their, in their cafeteria or, or cafe, let's call it. And I would go home every night and I'd make a piece of jewelry and I would go in and I never came home with the jewelry. Somebody brought it off my <laughs> neck. So I, everybody kept saying, why aren't you in Bergdorf's? And at that time they had a wonderful costume jewelry department. And I couldn't get them. I would keep calling them, and I never got a call back. So one day, I don't know what made me do it, I called them up, and I said, my name is Liz Friedman. I said, and I wouldn't be telling you this if I didn't like this store so much, but I'm doing a booming business in your uh, cafe, and it's a shame you're not making any money on it at all. <laughs> Could you call me? And in five minutes, they called me up to wanted to see me. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's pretty terrific. <coughs> and I did get in. Of course. I got in there right away. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was very, very funny. Love it. Where'd you go? The thing that my Pilates teacher said that he liked about your story Tell was me. that I came out as vulnerable. Yes. And I don't remember in what that, because that's something I have always sort of... <laughs> A part of me that was very, very hard. I don't like to be in a vulnerable position. Oh, so and yet, yes. unless you are and let, you, let yourself be that, yes, you're losing out a lot on life. Yeah. No, Mary Gordon, uh, that was quite a, a fascinating story. Is She grew up in Flushing, and I forget the name of her very first book that really hit me. Um, she grew up in Flushing and is very, very Catholic home. Mm. And her mother was sick. And she nursed her mother. Or no, the, at, at the first book she wrote, it was about her father. And she loved him, and he used to say to her, I love you more than life. Mm. And he was a wonderful father to her. And she went to Catholic schools, and everything was very Catholic, and the priests and the nuns That's and bad. so on. And um, then he died. She nursed him and died. And she started making some very horrible discoveries about her father. Oh. Number one is he was not Catholic. Her father was Jewish, which oh. he never acknowledged. And not only that, her father was a publisher and an editor of the most vile anti-Semitic materials that were oh, coming no. out during the Second World War. And as you find out in later books, oh. she went back and she had his body exhumed from the cemetery was and buried in a Jewish cemetery. Oh, good for her. 
and she grew up on uh, this Irish Catholic, very, very smart. I, I loved all her stuff. I haven't read any of it, and, 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 but one of her things was that Catholic upbringing of who do you think you are? Oh, and that's the who worst. Who do you yes. think you yes. are? Where is Jewish girls somehow had this thing about you strive to be better. They didn't have that. It's who do you think Ooh. you are? Well, the interesting thing about my mother is she didn't bring us up that way, but I think it's because her mother did. So she would just like, you could do anything you want. She put that in us, which... Uh, but I remember going on my first trip to Ireland to see our relatives. I remember feeling that in the air. You think you are all that. Who, it's like, oh, it's yes, always to I put do. you down in your place. Yes. Who do you think you are? Yes. No, 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 no. And Irish girls, I find that it, most of them have that. Mm. Something to fight. And so not only is who do you think you are, but they don't want other women to rise too high either. Oh, that's always, bad. Ooh, ooh, yeah, ooh. it's it's a tough one. Yeah, the story I wanted to relate was something that I think of so in my life now. When there are parts that we talk about those terrible years I had from 1979 to 1986, when everything fell apart and yes. my whole life fell apart and so on. And I'm I'm always reminded there was a very famous actress who lived upstairs from me, and I don't want to mention her name, but she was quite well known, and uh, she lived with another woman. And I was friends with that woman. And when the actress died, um, we would go. I was helping my friend clean out her stuff, and we found a diary that she had kept. Mm -hmm. And it started in 1943, and she'd apparently been either with the wax or with the waves um, in Mexico. And the first few pages of the diary were, you could tell they were written in ink, and she must have been crying a lot because it was like tear stains on the pages and it, they were like rippled and the ink was kind of running. And she was in Mexico and received news that she was going to be transferred back to the States. And she talked about her love of Mexico and how wonderful Mexico was. She said, but even more, she said, my relationship with Jorge. And she said, Jorge loves me so much. She says, he now says, I have mariachi bands serenading me. And every day it's chocolates and it's flowers. And how can I tear myself away from Jorge? And these pages were tear stained. Ugh. And then all of a sudden there was a whole clump of empty pages. And then she had apparently picked up this diary again, and it was 1967. The early ones were 1943. So we have 24 years. Oh, my goodness. And she said, here I am rereading this diary. Mexico was so wonderful, but who the hell was there? <laughs> and I think of that metaphorically as anything that happens in life always comes through. Today, it's so important. It's your whole life. And five years from now, who the hell was that? <laughs> and these guys, when I think about these guys that I knew and how I obsessed over them and lost sleep over them and cried over them and beat my breast over them and was suicidal over them, and today I would say, well, who the hell was that? Wow. And this fits very well into what is your biggest regret? Probably any angst spent on that. I tell you, any, I, as I said, my greatest regret in life was the amount of time I spent on men thinking about what they thought about me how I was going to impress them, how I was going to win them, how I was going to make them love me, yes. how I was going to have them forever. That was all. And yeah. It was all such a waste of time. <laughs> such a waste of time. Because okay. there isn't, because I, you know, I often think, was there one that I could say, I let him slip through my hands? Oh, and, yes. Yeah. That's a romantic notion. There is not one. Yes. No, not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> You're clear on not that. Not one. <laughs> Even ones I obsessed over. No, not in. <laughs> not in. There, there was a favorite love of mine who passed away. And so I was clinging to that of that's the one that got it's away. It's easy when they're gone. Very. And then I found an old crazy love letter from him. And it was just one of those dawning moments of, oh, he was crazy. I was crazy. No, 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 no. He happens to be dead, but he was not the love of my life. No. <laughs> I, there were certain men that I loved very much, but as I say, they were bosses. Yes. They were various relationships, but they were never anybody I had sex with. Never. <laughs> that sounds, yeah. That sounds like something like uh, Gore Vidal said. I think Gore Vidal yes, said did. that. Yes, he did. He did say that. He was together with the same man for 50 years. And he said, they said to him, how did you do it? He said, it was easy. We never had sex. Fantastic. What would you say is the 
it was or is the biggest risk you've taken in life? Uh, the biggest risk I've taken in life? I, I think one of them was being single. Yes. Was being single. That Knowing that I didn't know what was going to happen with this. And as people would say, you'll be old and you'll be alone. And somehow I kept thinking, well, if I'm old and, you know, I'm decrepit and look a mess and I'm sick, who wants anybody around? And I don't have and to take care of somebody to else. just take that risk of not having kids and not having yes. kids and whatever it took, I think that's probably the greatest risk I ever took in yeah. my life. I love that because even, even now, I've been single for a long time, and the holidays come up, and there's still, not for me, because I'm comfortable with it, but there's still this awkwardness of couples and who you're going to come. I'm coming along. Is that okay? I, and the minute people would come up to me and say, oh, we'd love to introduce you to somebody, oh. you know, my thought was, what's the matter? I'm not good enough alone. <laughs> and I, I hated it. I didn't want to, because it, one or two things would happen. Um, they would bring, introduce me, and some guy would show up, and they would say, you two would get along wonderfully. And I think, how could you know me? How could you think well of me and introduce me to somebody like this? How could you? I mean, this guy's a disaster. <laughs> that was it. And the other thing was that if it didn't work out, he would go to my friends and say, boy, what a loser she is, you know? So it was a no-win game. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. And they all feel immediately. So my friend said, yeah, because they're all miserable and misery loves God. You're passing it around. And, misery, and I find that a lot of married women years ago felt very threatened by my presence. Oh, I bet. As if I was, you know, going to go after all their husbands. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wishful thinking, honey. <laughs> so what year did you leave your husband? I was divorced in 1972. Oh, okay. 1972. And for a while there, oh, I just wanted to get back into it and find the next guy and the next guy. But somewhere around 40, I just, that ceased to be an issue. I, I stopped completely at 45, but from 40 to 45, it really wasn't very important. And, you know, when people would ask me about that, even today, you know, you meet older women and they'll say to you, well, do you have a fella in your life? Oh, come on. <laughs> do we have to go through this? <laughs> do we have to go through this? Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, here may be my last question, but maybe not. Um, what would you say was the happiest time of your life? The happiest times of my life was always, of course, when I was alone, and I used to love it. I had a friend who used to see me periodically, and she'd say, Oh, Liz, you're looking wonderful. I guess you're not in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was such a great lie, because it was so true. <laughs> I'm always happy when I can do my own thing, when I can do my own creative things, when I can make things. I mean, those hours when I would make jewelry or when I was sewing or was when I'm involved oh, in a craft yes. project or a cooking project, knowing you're completely on center. Yes. There's nobody there, and I don't have to explain why I want yes. to stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning yes. and finish this. Yes, you don't have yes. to. you just just there in the passage of time. You just don't even notice it. And I don't want to explain why I do this or why I think it's important or what am I going to do with this or if I'm going to sell it. That's all. I'm not interested in any of that. Those are the happiest, happiest times moments. of my life. I yes. completely relate. Yeah, good. And I must <laughs> say that I thought my glorious years started in my 60s. In my oh, really? 70s, it got better. And in 80s, it's just magical. I don't know how long it's going to last because I know much of it is about health. And fortunately, I've been blessed with very good health. Yes. And I keep thinking, these days I have, I could just, just let me tell you what my yesterday was like. Do. I'll tell you about my yesterday. Um, I went to Pilates in the morning, and then I have my young 23-year-old friend, Ava, that we do Pilates together, and we always go to lunch mm -hmm. um, at EJ's Luncheonette, which we love. Then I came home, and I took a nap, and I got all dressed, and I went to Lincoln Center. I met a woman about a month ago, just casually talking to her, and she's an artist. Her name is N Nevis Wildauer. Yes. Wildauer. Wildauer. And she was from Vienna, and she told me that she'd been brought to the United States by the Austrian consulate, and she was going to do a major installation at Lincoln Center um, as part of this thing honoring women and the 100th anniversary of suffrage, of women's suffrage. Yes. 
Anyway, I went to this reception thinking it was going to be a big elaborate affair, and it was actually in a very small room. It was the archives of the New York Philharmonic. And she spoke, and I knew nothing about this. Um, there were some glass pieces that she had done on a table, but they are going to be part of some big installation that's going to be there. I haven't seen it. And she talked about it, this incredible story. It was of a woman named Steffi Goldner. And somehow she had picked up a harp case at a flea market in North Carolina. And it belonged, she found out, to someone named Steffi Goldner. And she did research and found out that Steffi Goldner was the first woman to be in the New York Philharmonic. This was 1922. She was the first woman at the New York Philharmonic. She was a harpist. And she stayed there for three years as the only woman. And then she got married and gave it up. Wow. And who did she marry? Eugene Ormandy, the greatest, one of the America's greatest conductors. Philadelphia Orchestra, I mean, he was in the pantheon of yes. great conductors. Yes. And of course, he did not want her having a career. Oh my God. And it, there was, a, last night at this reception, I got to talking to this woman who was in her 90s, and her name was Doris Ballant. Yeah. And she was the niece of Steffi Goldner. Oh. And she told me she was brought to this country. She was from Vienna herself. Mm. She was brought to this country by um, Eugene Ormandy and her aunt, and she lived with them. And she said, she was talking to me about Ormandy, and we all knew, anybody who knew about Ormandy, he, uh, Ormandy, he was very, very arrogant. Mm. And she said his wife had become so self-effacing here was this woman, oh, the first woman. Terrible. When people uh, would say to her, do you play any instrument? He would answer, yes, he said, she plays the record player. Uh, this was his response. Uh, and to be crushed, and crushed. like that. And uh. she was an extraordinary musician, as was this woman's mother, who was her sister. Mm. And to hear this connection in this story, eventually How they split amazing. after 25 years. I mean, you have to understand that me, for me, the music world, and this was Ormandy's wife, and she was a harpist. Do you know that another woman did not come into the Philharmonic until 1960? This was from 1922. My God, really? Amazing. Now, and now, last night, when they were performing here at the orchestra's women, no. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But yes. that's not all orchestras, you know. There were people there from the uh, Vienna Philharmonic. European orchestras don't do that. They still have mostly men. Yes, 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 yes. But well, how do you like this? She plays the record player. That is some story. Oh, amazing. That's quite a, quite a day. Yesterday. But if you, and, and, so that was it. And then today, <laughs> I started out my day. I had a private Pilates session. And then I ran to lunch at, at, at this new restaurant, Volclos, with four fabulous women, all talking. One of them was the wife, I, I hope they don't listen to this, a uh, very no, no, no. well-known accountant yeah. in the theatrical world. And they were all looking at me like I'm the luckiest person in the world. Oh, so I, did oh I bet. I did. And you do this? You go around, you go to the movies by yourself? <laughs> of course I go to the I movies love by, going myself. To by myself. I do. Yes. It's the only way I want to go. Yes, yes, yes. And you travel by yourself? Is there another way? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, and look in amazement, you know? Okay. So anyway, we go to lunch, and then I come down here, and I see my friend Mary Ellen. Mary Jane. Mary Jane. I see Mary Jane. And then I come home, and I could take a nap, and then I could look at some good movies, and it's a perfect day. What am I doing tomorrow? Tomorrow I go to Pilates, and then I meet some fabulous lady for lunch, and then I meet two friends, and we're going to dinner, and then we're going to see Matthew Bourne's Swan. Oh, how fun! I was, I was going to see if I could get. Yes, I love it. It's yes, the most amazing it's thing you've ever fantastic. seen. It's fantastic. I know. It's yes. Most, so I. These That's are my the, days. The last I mean, night. And I yes. have. I just every day is like a party. Oh, beautiful! I just, now, why did this happen for you in your sixties, your glorious? Is it because you retired? You liked your first. Job. I had money. Yes, I yeah. had money to Let's, do this. That yes. was very, very yes, important. Yes, yes, yes. Secondly, there was that confidence that I had that allowed me to do this. Yes. You know, I don't have to be afraid of anything. No. I have money. You know, I don't have to worry. I don't need to ingratiate myself with anybody. And I remember 
uh, my brother used to use a term, he used to call it fuck you money. <laughs> yeah, you have a certain amount of money, you can tell the rest of the world to fuck itself. You don't need that. As soon as you need, as soon as you need yes. anybody for anything, you're in a vulnerable position. And I think that for most men, that's very, very important. That's why it's very difficult for them to be with a woman who has more money than they have. Yes, it doesn't Because either. they use money to control. Mm. And if she has the money, mm. what are they going to mm, do? Mm, 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 what are they going to do? Yes. <laughs> Same thing as I used to have a friend who had been divorced, a guy. He had been divorced, and his ex-wife was a very, very rich woman. And she died and left his two children fortunes of money, nothing to him. He said, Liz... Do you know what it's like to try to discipline your kids knowing how much money they have <laughs> and they know? Yeah. You know, you got to use money to control your kids, but if they have more than you, <laughs> how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? So could uh, New York is your city. Can you imagine living anywhere else? Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I mean, for 10 minutes, yes, you know. But always with, the, I, you know, I lived in Israel for many years. And then when I was married, we lived all, it was always knowing I had to get back to New York. Yeah. I couldn't see myself. I could see you in, in Paris. Yeah, Paris was good, but you, then you had the French, you know. <laughs> Don't want to deal with them. Uh -huh. Fitting. Yeah, I too always need to come home. Oh, yes. Yeah. This, is, this, is, uh, this is our roots, you know. I'd love to be, you know, I remember I had a renowned history professor at City College, Hans Cohen, and he used to say that you shouldn't spend your life developing roots. You should sprout wings so that you can go anywhere in the world and feel comfortable and I used to think that was wonderful but I I'm New York yes I remember yeah, yeah. I, when I lived in Jerusalem and friends would come to my apartment they'd say if we didn't know better we would think we were in the middle of Manhattan <laughs> I was not interested in being acculturated <laughs> even about learning languages I haven't got to speak English for a minute to say worthwhile <laughs> Well, my final argument. question to you, and I think I said that a few times, is I, you may have answered it just in your spirit, but how do you keep this va va voom for life? I don't know. I don't know if there's any formula. Curiosity? I must say that I have recently gotten into meditation, and I find meditation extraordinarily, extraordinarily helpful mm. um, of keeping me out of dark places. Yes. Um, and, you know, the minute I find my head just going into the one, I say, okay, that's there. We can go to that neighborhood when we feel like, but let's, yes. let's get out of there for the moment. Yes. And you do it too. Yes, I do. It's, yes. yes. I, don't, I don't know how I deal without it. Yeah. It's, like I keep thinking, as long as you do that, everything becomes manageable. Mm. Everything becomes manageable. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have talked to me, and I have practiced in my DA issues, um, the 12 Steps. And, and keeping with those 12 steps for a way of life? Mm -hmm. Oh, the 12 steps is, is truly... I, I think that as I got older, I began to appreciate that for everything in life, I don't care what it is, mm -hmm. um, it, it, making your breakfast in the morning, or having relationships, there's a strategy. Yes. And I never wanted to deal with that. I always wanted to I kind of shoot from the hip. There's no strategy. And the 12 steps are a strategy. It's a strategy and a roadmap for living your life. Yes. And as long as you do that, you really, you know, who was it who said to me the other day, and I thought it was great, he said, if you look into your past, what do you have? Everybody looks into their past, depression. Look into the future, and what do you have? Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Mm -hmm. But if you stay in today, you have serenity. Mm. Beautiful. Isn't that right? Yes. Just today. There's nothing to be afraid of today. Yes. It's, oh, what's going to happen? Yes. Oh, what happened with my boobs? Yes. Yesterday? Today. And meditation helps you stay today. Mm, absolutely. It works. Oh, this is fabulous. One more about this. One more question for the road. Um, so, are you working on your jewelry now? What are you up to now? Um, I... You know, I do it sporadically, and thank God I don't have to depend on, you know, for my yes. living on that stuff. But I love it. You know, like, I'll just go out and I'll see some something that uh, inspires me. Um, it might be an element. I love to go into toy stores. Like, in, that was from a toy store, those little things, and think, oh, what am I going to do with that? Or where am I going to hang this from, from my ears from here? And then I'm always redoing pieces. And I like to use 
very unorthodox materials. I don't like to go into bead stores and buy beads. That's no fun. No. But I, as I said, I like to go into toy stores. I like to go into hardware stores. <laughs> but, you know, there'll be periods where I don't really do anything. And then I'm compulsively, obsessively working for hours and hours. And it's, it's very, very satisfying. You know, like I'll go to bed and in the middle of the night I'll think, oh, that's the way you do that piece. Oh. And then I get up and I have to get the materials together and go through my closets and I have to do it. And the next thing I know, it's six o'clock in the morning and I haven't slept at all. And I, I have to do I it. I love that drive. So do people then still contact you? Uh, I think there are a lot of people that want to buy it, but I don't want to sell it. You oh, know? you don't want to sell no, it No, I don't like no. selling it. I really don't. Oh. I like to wear it and I like to get compliments on it and I like to tell people the story, but I don't really want to sell anything. You've done that. Yeah, I've done that. And couple of dollars mm -hmm. and I'm going to make change my life. Well, one thing, well, last time or one of the times we met, you talked about starting a glove. Uh, oh, we were just do, doing that with a friend of mine. We just didn't, we called it for glovers only. <laughs> I just see gloves. Uh, not many people wear gloves, but I think gloves are the greatest oh, accessory. Oh, I love gloves. I yes. Do. And I just love these colors and I love these fingerless gloves. And I don't these. spend much money on clothes. Oh, sure. I yes. don't spend much money on clothes at all. Like for me to buy a thing for a hundred dollars or twenty dollars was a lot. But I'll spend four hundred dollars on a pair of clothes. You know, <laughs> because, accessories. Right, accessories yes. are everything. Yes, yes, and make, yes. And that's what the, making the jewelry does for me. That's yes. an accessory. Yes, I, I just have. It's like I bought this jacket at the show, mm -hmm. and then I saw these earrings, and she said, "Who did them?" She said, "Valentino." I don't think they really. I, I need those stars because the stars go with my jacket. <laughs> Get paid as much for the stars as I did for the jacket, but that's the thing. Or, or they'll go home, and then I find I, I have 20 stars at home that I used to make. <laughs> Lots of stars. <laughs> Whatever. You know, the nice thing about living through, with myself and supporting myself, I don't have to explain to anybody. Mm. So I, I bought stars, and I already have stars. So I bought a yes. my 100th black shoe. And I have 25 that I never wore. So what? I'm not taking the money from you. <laughs> Didn't ask you for the money. It's mine. Right. That's yes. all. I remember asking you, or I'm asking you again, what would you say to young women, or to younger women out there? I, I think that my usual response is have your own, be your own, do your own. Love that. Have it all to yourself. You can. I love Norma Kamali, who's a, I just am such a fan of hers. Her company is called OMO. You know what OMO stands for? No. On my own. Oh, beautiful. On my own. Her mm. own building, her own label. Her, she oh. doesn't account to anybody for anything but herself. Love, Love it. That. Love it.